and welcome to this Naval Studies Group podcast, the first of three recorded at a recent seminar in the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Nowra, New South Wales. This group of three episodes examines the operations of the Fleet Air Arm in the Vietnam War, primarily in conjunction with the US Army and also with the Royal Australian Air Force. It also discusses the challenges faced by families while loved ones were deployed, and the challenges faced as those returning from Vietnam settled back into a peacetime environment. This first episode presents five speakers, four of whom discuss preparing to deploy to Vietnam and what it was like to operate with the US Army and the RAF. It's my pleasure now to introduce Commodore Chris Smallhorn, Commander Fleet Air Arm, who will give the opening address, which will set the scene for us. Um, uh, ladies and gents, uh, first of all, uh, welcome. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Jack McCaffrey for the effort that he's gone into to pull this, uh, this event together. This is extraordinarily important in my mind. It is indeed legacy in motion. And we're talking about the legacy that has been left by helicopter flight Vietnam during those extraordinary years of operations from September 1967 to June of 1971. Um, I'd also like to make special mention, of course, for our overall host, and that is the Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society, and uh, UNSW, as a, a former studier at uh, UNSW, it makes me very proud to be able to stand here as finally one of the presenters. I'm more used to being presented at by all those lecturers that ask me questions that I could never answer. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice to get a few in the audience so I could try and get them back a little bit, but perhaps today is, uh, is not the day. Some words come to mind, and they're words that we've heard that have almost become common in our language, and some of them aren't. Slicks, gunships, Charlie Charlie, a night hunter killer, Bung Tao, Black Horse, Bear Cat, Dong Tan. Field engineering and innovation and finding a way when no one else can see a way, hogs and taipans. These are words that are the language of those who served in Vietnam during that period. And to some of us, it's become popular language through places, whether they be books, such as the wonderful book given by Max Speedy and, uh, to, to Australia some years ago, or whether it be the many movies made on Vietnam. But some of those words are your words and the words of our veterans who served. Not enough here in Australia is known about the history of what these very brave men did and also what the very brave families did back home and enduring such a long time away. Deployments of a year. We don't know about deployments of a year very much in our military anymore. Typically six months to eight months is a long deployment. We have just in the Navy started to extend our deployments to nine months. But yet those who deployed in those years knew only 12 months. That is an extraordinarily long time. Out of a child's lifetime, out of a, uh, a wife and husband together in their marriage, um, out of just paying off a house. It's all those simple things that we so easily forget. But yet, while we're sending our men in those days into harm's way, so many other things were foregone. Uh, and it is, a, it is a cost that many of our Australians do not understand. Part of this seminar is to help to bring that story more richly and more fulsomely to the wider population. Our relationship and EMU as a whole, our Navy's relationship with 135th, what an extraordinary story. And we have seven of the folks here, including Fred Dunaway, who I'm looking at now out in the audience, not that those on the podcast can see that, but uh, a gentleman who has tirelessly sought to make sure that those who fought and those who stood the line continue to be recognised both then and now. And Fred, for your dedication to that and on behalf of not just those who served, that those of us who get to try and live up to your legacies, thank you for what you have done. We lost five people from the Australians. Our four contingents were led by four extraordinary people, and we're very fortunate that a couple of those are visiting with us at the moment, three indeed. But today, um, Rear Admiral Ralph is certainly sitting in the, in the crowd now, and he was in command from September 67 to October 68. Sadly, Commander Zork, Graham Zork Rorschein, is unable to be with us September 68 to October 69. Commodore Dave Farthing, who is with us September 69 to October 70. And finally, uh, the Vulnerable Commander Winston James. If for nothing else, what a great name. Winston James, September the 70th to uh, 70 to June 1971. Those lost names, Lieutenant Commander Pat Vickers on the 22nd of February 1968. Lieutenant Tony Casadillo, the 21st of August 1968. Petty Officer O'Brien, Darkie Phillips on the 21st of August uh, 68, along with Tony, Acting Sub-Lieutenant Tony Hewlin on the 3rd of January 69, and Leading Seaman Knowles' ship on the 31st of May 69, along with 32 of our US colleagues. These are extraordinary figures. 
I know and I'm very conscious that there are veterans sitting in front of me today who lived what was both the nightmare, the excitement and the adrenaline of Vietnam. Uh, and I don't mean to mention those names to bring back memories of the past, but if indeed our endeavour is to tell our story to Australia, we mustn't forget those names. We should never forget those names. And it is about commemorating service. There were 196 Australians that we sent to Vietnam during the period September 67 to June 1971. By best count at the moment, we've lost 59 of those people to various causes since they came home. There are 11, we're just not sure where they are. Five, I've mentioned, were lost in, uh, in combat. There are 92 Australians and seven Americans who have come to, to this, this three days of commemoration, of mateship, of getting together and telling your stories and sharing your time uh, together uh, out of the, those remaining left. An extraordinary figure. It is 74% of those who are still with us are here on these three days have travelled from all over Australia and around the world. The legacy of EMU and the 135th lives on in the United States through the talented hands of Andy Perry, who is also here with us today, and through the, 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 the ownership of Jeff Carr, who's also with us, who brings EMU 309, still gracing the skies of the United States today, one of the original machines, visiting veterans and telling, and, and telling that story, but bringing mateship. I'd make, take this moment because we must not forget the deleterious effects of war, the PTSD, as it is known certainly um, today. I will never go as far as to say that our associations, whether it be the Fleet Aram Associations, those serving associations in the United States, the Boyger Association, the Sydney Association, or indeed the Naval Association, I will never go as far as to say that they save lives, but I will say that they improve the quality of life. The mateship endures, the ability to share stories and talk about what went on in the past with those who understand makes such the difference, and I see quality of life improvement as a result of that. Andy, Jeff, what you do in the United States is not forgotten by those of us back home. You help that quality of life, and I thank you in this public fora uh, for what you, have, uh, what you have done. It wasn't at all uncommon for somebody to come home after 12 months on operations to fly 1,200 hours. I, I went to the funeral of Commander Clive Mayo earlier this year. I, was, um, I didn't know too many of the Vietnam veterans. I didn't join until 1987, so many of the names, some I did, but many of the names were only names. I hadn't met their faces. It was the first time I got to really spend some quality time together. In one year, Clive flew 1,200 hours, was shot down six times, had an engine failure and crash landed another aircraft, lost one of his crew members, came home to command 816 Squadron of the Royal Australian Navy. His story was not unique. We have maintenance personnel who I find the work they did out in the field utterly extraordinary. I heard yesterday while talking to Benny Barefoot, uh, uh, even, even the name again starts to bring a picture um, uh, to you, old Benny Barefoot, and he tells me the story about going out into the field with an aircraft that's been shot down to find that one of the control um, elements, one of the control rods has been shot through. So, uh, no, he doesn't leave the aircraft there. He drills a hole through the top broken bit, the bottom broken bit, gets a piece of metal, straps some wires around it, locks it in place, apparently found a brave pilot who turned it on again, and flew it back to base. This is what it took to win. This is what it took to get through the day. This is what it took to get through the posting. The extraordinary art, I use the word deliberately, the extraordinary art of our maintenance personnel, our engineering personnel, is what enabled the fight to happen. And it must never be forgotten, and it should be remembered. And I hope that those very men who are here on this weekend in Nasnara will spend some time with my young sailors and tell them those stories. That's not to say I want a young sailor to go out on the line today, find a broken control rod and start just zapping things together. But I do want that young man or that young woman who one day we are likely to send into harm's way to know that this is what you've got to do. It is about winning. Again, we don't often say enough. In our business, there is no prize for second place. Uh, it is the harsh reality of, the, uh, of the, the, uh, the armed conflict game that we're in. EMU won three MBEs. Eight DSCs, five DFCs, one BEM, 24 mentioned dispatches and 34 Naval Board commendations. And a Silver Star, amongst many other uh, battle honours, uh, amongst many other awards, foreign awards, for the folks who served in that unit. What, what an extraordinary list for just shy of four years of operations. Our maintenance personnel I've mentioned, the bravery of our air crew goes without saying. 
Every other day you flew into harm's way, you took rounds, you came home and you turned around and you did it again. If your mate was down, your maintenance team gave you an aircraft and you strapped yourself to it and you went and got them. It's what was expected of you, but the difference was you did it. It's what's expected of the air crew and the maintainers, the officers and sailors of today. And I'd like to say that the young Australians that we are producing and bringing the fled air arm, they're good. They're just as good and you can be proud of them. And if they're put on the line, I promise you, they will do their duty as well and you will be proud of them. But you will be proud of them because you left us a legacy. You left us a legacy that we just try very hard to live up to. And I hope during your time with us and as we talk today together, you will walk away with an impression that perhaps we're at the very least doing our best and maybe even you'll gain a reflection that we're doing okay. In the game of aviation, if someone says, that's a good bloke, that's a good girl, or you're doing okay, that's about as good as the accolades get. So if any of you walk away from here and say, Smalley, you're doing okay, I'll take that on behalf of the 1,200 officers, sailors and public servants of our, of our fleet air arm of today. But I will come close to finishing here to talk about those who are at home. The, the mums, the wives, the children, uh, the sisters, the brothers, uh, the extended family and the friends who weren't sure what the next knock at the door was going to be, who got to watch probably the first war in motion on TV in front of them and really knew what their loved ones were up to. Sometimes too much information can make it hurt. And I'd say you were the first generation to understand what the visual image of war when your loved one was in amongst it felt like, and I use the word hurt deliberately. I don't know how you endured what you did, but I stand in front of you in awe of your courage, I stand in front of you in awe of your bravery, and I'm pretty confident that every uh, loved one back home today, if we have to do this all again, are going to also look to you for that strength of character to be able to stand up and be reckoned when the time comes. This seminar is going to catch a, the, capture a little bit of the history through the lens of yesteryear, but it's going to be through the eyes and the minds of today and of those who have put some of those years behind them, but are now maybe looking at them through different eyes. And I very much look forward to hearing those perspectives. They are as important as the comments from the first day you got home from theatre. To know and embrace our past, I just think gives us a fighting chance for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the past that you have offered us and let me hope that we can do our very best to live up to your legacy in motion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, for that excellent opening address. Our next two speakers will recount their experiences in preparing to deploy to Vietnam, one from the perspective of a maintainer and the other a pilot. The first speaker will be Petty Officer John McCartney, who was a member of the 2nd HFV and served as NCO in charge of the US Army's 68th Signal Detachment, providing avionics and communication support for the 135th Assault Helicopter Company. Thank you very much, Jack. This is the second time in two days that I've had to follow on from a small one. It's a little bit of a bad idea, so somebody's out of the uh, <coughs> I initially uh, consisted of uh, us being issued with uh, green clothing. We did away with our naval uniforms and our comrades and what have you when we, uh, we put on the, the jungle greens to put the, the sort of green off the fighting machine. And we did a lot of uh, uh, introduction to what Vietnam was, some of the culture, uh, naval intelligence to focus. More importantly, they uh, also go to a lot of physical training. We uh, did circuit training. I went down to the gym and did circuit training because it was established we had to be fit to, to go away and do these jobs. And uh, the uh, best part of that was we, we were vaguely fit before we went to Kanunga. And Kanunga uh, is the, uh, the Australian Army's General Training Centre. It's a little holiday camp to the, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, Gold Coast and the hinterland and uh, we spent three weeks of fun, travel and adventure there. We uh, were put in with the army. The, uh, there was no sort of differentiation with, uh, with the rank structure. Everybody wore jungle green clothing, no rank and um, everybody sort of got in and uh, did their uh, little job. Now we have a number of um, slides. And that, this is fairly typical of a day. Can everybody hear me with that microphone? Is the camera okay? Uh, we, uh, at the um, 
sessions like that where we where weapons handling was very critical. We did weapons training before we left here, and that was honed into us at uh, at Cronungra, where there's little exercises where the, uh, you've got to dissemble a weapon, the guy behind you reassembles it, and you do these little contests all the time. And it got you used to actually handling your weapons, stripping them down, so in the case of your weapon jammed, you knew how to control it. And so it was very important, these little uh, exercises. We, um, we lived in tents, that was the lines and the, um, at the uh, top left there, the, the tents that we uh, lived in. Um, and the, uh, the top right is um, a person descending a wall uh, into the thing called the bear pit. This is a part of a confidence course where you ran through barbed wire, you were smoked, you uh, did all sorts of things and it concluded with jumping off a 27 foot tower into, uh, into the water. That particular one, you go through a uh, mirror maze, they used to smoke us, and you had to jump over this log wall into the bear pit. Every uh, week, the, I can't remember the day, but every week a, uh, a class would graduate. That the night before they graduated, they'd all go to the wet canteen, get dreadfully drunk, do disgusting things into the bear pit, find dead animals and throw into it so the, all the new people arriving could experience what they experienced. Uh, all good conditioning. Uh, the, um, down the bottom left is Tom Supple, who is coming out of the uh, tactical river crossing. Uh, we did ours on a Sunday uh, in the middle of July. It was as cold as a witch's whistle, and uh, you got saturated and you just had to deploy tactically on the other side. A uh, uh, interesting experience. And the, uh, and the bottom right is, a, uh, is another part of the confidence course of going through uh, corrugated iron tunnels and all sorts of things and crawling under barbed wire and doing all that sort of disgusting stuff. There is Ted Winberg dismantling an SLR. Oh, there we go. Uh, dismantling an SLR, and that's a, that's a part of the uh, little team thing where you run along, dismantle, reassemble. Yep. Uh, and that's just another group sh uh, photo of, uh, of the people uh, in the area doing the, the same sort of thing, I think, with an F1 in that case. And um, that's our lines again. It's just the tents. There's Ted Winberg, the close-up with an M60. Um, finds that they do actually fall apart. So, uh, yep, that's uh, young Ted at it. Um, and that's Tom uh, Supple. Um, sort of trying to look like a, a drowning rat crossing a river. The, uh, the army's there to make sure he doesn't drown. Uh, just some more uh, sort of in the bush type stuff for uh, doing our training. The joys of rapes uh, in that part. That is a, another part where they um, actually took us out to a, uh, a, well, was a rifle range there as well in this area and uh, there was all this barbed wire that uh, entanglements everywhere and uh, they used to smoke it and they used to let off explosions on either side of you and you had to charge forward and um, the um, lead person um, would come up to the barbed wire entanglement and you'd throw yourself onto it and run over it. I think I've still got Max Speedy's footprint in my back uh, <laughs> going through that. Uh, yeah, the secret was don't be the man in front uh, because you had to be the one to throw yourself on uh, a barbed wire and let everybody run over you. Um, and uh, it was to help sort of particularly the uh, uh, sailors who had never experienced loud bangs going off beside us, machine gun, they had a Vickers machine gun fix and that used to fire over our heads and, uh, and they'd smoke us and do all sorts of things and you'd have instructors screaming at you uh, at the same time. So it was all a, uh, a bit of a learning experience and panic. The uh, second contingent was uh, split into Group A, Group B, and that is Group A. They got the naval photographer, we didn't, so our history uh, isn't recorded, but uh, Zork uh, is, uh, is there, and, uh, and Ted Winberg, I think, is hiding up the back of that. So, uh, and there's a bunch of uh, photos, uh, Rick Simmons, uh, Charlie Rex, uh, all those sort of guys are uh, hidden away in there. Uh, Bob, Max and I, we're in the third. Mike, you might have been in that group. No, I was in this one. You were in the first group. Rangers. Yeah, yep. Rangers. That's different to what we called you, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I'm a bad corporal, I'm in the back row. That's how we did instruction in the field. At um, some ungodly hour in the middle of the night, they'd get, wake you up and you'd do PT, have breakfast, then you'd double over to a, uh, an instructional area, which uh, was on the side of a hill. Good instructional techniques ensures that the sun is not shining in the student's eyes to uh, distract them. That, of course, equates to the student sitting on frosted ground, freezing like buggery while the instructor stands in the sun and uh, gets warm. And they had these portable uh, boards for uh, various instructional things. Um, so it was a, uh, a mobile classroom. Oh, just one, one of the signs that, um, at, uh, at, uh, a sign with a bit of fun on it at, uh, at Cronungra. The, uh, one of the joys we found there was uh, by saying camming up, you'd uh, have to put all the stuff on it. You can see there Alan Hutchins putting his makeup on. He always enjoyed that. I can never understand why we got green and black stuff and he always had something nice and pink, but anyway. <laughs> uh, that's Ted again. That's another one, a uh, shot of the uh, area where we're running through and we're letting off big bangs to frighten us, etc. That's uh, uh, Bob Brennan working on the F1. Uh, some more patrol walking down the road. Um, usually a double, but in this case they're doing a march. One of the things we didn't train for was the way of we used to get stores. And um, the, the, uh, Jerry Schoenberg was one of the uh, maintenance uh, pilots also. Uh, he was the technical supply officer. And we used to do a lot of work together. And um, so he'd come and say, get your gear, let's go. We've got to go get some stores. And uh, half the time you never knew where you were going or what you were going to get. In this case, it was a tail boom. So sling it through the guts of the aircraft tie it down and away you go, and that's how you bring it back. I was experiencing my sort of taste for teaching uh, there, and I'm training young uh, PFC uh, Wes Bullock on how to uh, smoke in an aircraft while you're repairing avionics. <laughs> Yep, and that, that was the uh, the sort of um, uh, the the training we uh, we did going through Cronungra to turn us into this um, uh, pseudo army type person, and you know it w wasn't just sort of learning how to speak slowly. You um, had to uh, actually try and act like a soldier as well. So uh, there was a few. Tom thought that was funny. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so that that was uh, a part of that. How am I going for time? Um, the uh, one of the negative sides of it, uh, which I hope the Navy will learn from, was the um, uh, the training for the avionics people. When the UH-1Bs arrived in uh, Australia, all the avionics were stripped out of them, and old equipment like TR-1936s, which are VHF sets uh, in gannets, venoms, vampires, fireflies, Dakotas were inserted in a PDR-170, a Wessex uh, UHF radio. So we didn't experience any avionics training uh, before we went to Vietnam. When uh, the first time we, ar we arrived, well, when I arrived, Frank Lord, who was my leading hand, took me out the aircraft and showed me what a, uh, an aircraft with uh, proper radios looks like. So that was my introduction. So we had to do, learn the, uh, the equipment. It was new equipment, uh, new configurations, new... Um, uh, administrative system and a new re uh, reporting system. That was totally uh, you know, sort of brand new to us. On top of that, we also uh, looked after uh, ground communications. So um, we had the ground radio equipment, we had uh, voice secure equipment, the crypto stuff. Uh, I tried getting an American crypto clearance, but I was an alien, so that failed. Uh, and um, also uh, telephone lines. I'd never heard of climbing spikes, let alone actually go up a pole and try and uh, uh, what's that, repair telephone lines. 
Bill uh, Murphy, who is with us at the moment, he came out from California. He's with us uh, to, today at the, or with us with the reunion. He taught me how to climb a, a, a telegraph pole using climbing spikes, which you strap onto the leg. Billy said, it's a piece of cake. If you slip, all you do is put lean backwards and the safety belt will, will latch up. No way in the world when you're on top of a pole and something slips, your foot slips out, are you going to throw yourself backwards? It just does not happen. So Bill will be glad to know that I finally removed all the splitters that I've got all down through here. <laughs> So, so, so there was a, um, uh, a lot of learning experience going on there. And should the Navy uh, ever do another thing, if they can get somebody who's competent in job task analysis and also training needs analysis, please employ them to ensure that everybody across the board has an equal amount of competency before they leave and they, you're not starting on the back foot. Thank you all very much. Thanks, John. And now for the aircrew perspective, we turn to Lieutenant Commander Jeff Dalgleish, who was a member of the first HFE and as a slick pilot and the youngest one at that. Thanks, Thank you. When I agreed to participate in this seminar, I soon realised that I had the perfect reference book in my possession, and that was the book A Bloody Job Well Done, collated and edited by Max and uh, Max Speedy and Bob Ray. Um, not only did the task at hand force me to read this lengthy tome, I must admit I had it for years but hadn't read it, uh, but it gave me an insight from a cross-section of all ranks and rates from the flight OICs to the most junior officer and sailor involved with also valuable input from the US Army personnel. Mind you, all may not necessarily be totally factual, but <laughs> let's leave that one where it is but definitely some strong opinions are voiced that all may not agree with, but it's a comprehensive record of how personnel thought and reacted. Therefore, I've unashamedly used some of the information gleaned from this publication, plus, of course, my own logbook and fading memory, like all of us, I, I guess. So if you hear me use something that you contributed, please don't accuse me of plagiarism. I'm, in fact, paying you a compliment by utilising some of your information. From the perspective of the first flight, which I was a member, as Jack said, uh, I was the most junior pilot our on our flight. I was a sub-lieutenant and I was 19 years old when I was actually posted to the HFB, 20 when I deployed. Most of the flight crew from the first flight were embarked in HMAS Melbourne, either on 817, flying 31A, uh, or uh, Gannets and, and Venoms on uh, uh, 816 Squadron. We were enjoying a port visit in Hong Kong when we were informed in June 67 uh, that we were to form up the first flight of the HFB and deploy later in the year to South Vietnam. The nominate nominate air crew would leave the ship in Melbourne and fly, uh, sorry, the ship Melbourne in Singapore and fly back to Australia. That was all very top secret in Melbourne, but uh, from what I gather, it wasn't very top secret back here. En route, uh, we actually participated in Exercise Sea Dog. Uh, which is the Seato exercise, but under Lieutenant Commander Pat Vickers' uh, able direction, Pat was uh, on 817 with the rest of us, we started un undertaking an indoctrination process for our transition from being ASW, or primarily ASW aircrew, uh, to being part of a US Army assault helicopter company, ground-based in South Vietnam. Had a lot of active assistance from the ship staff, including the CGBLO, uh, Major Frank Crow. Uh, whose army world was pretty new to most of us. Intelligence, recognition, Vietnamese history, Australian involvement in Vietnam up to that point, and basically anything pertinent that we could lay our hands on. Next to nothing was available on US Army Assault Helicopter Company operations. A couple of days in Singapore, we flew first class by RAF Hercules, uh, Singapore to Darwin overnight, uh, and then on to, uh, to Melbourne, uh, sorry, on to, to Sydney, and then a passes bus picked us up in uh, Richmond. Great way to come home. And then we went on directly on leave. During this time, uh, our OIC, now Rear Admiral retired Neil Ralph, visited Vietnam for 10 days to, to gain an appreciation of the HFV operating conditions and how to best utilise the short time that the first flight had to train prior to deployment. By the end of August, all personnel of the HFV had joined 723 Squadron. Pilots undertook refams and instrument ratings 
uh, on the UH1B, all of us were previously qualified on type. Observers and air crewmen flew on many of these sorties to become familiar with the aircraft, even though their role, that is the observers and air crewmen's role, was a bit vague for how they were going to be utilised at this time. Formation flying, multiple aircraft as best we could with a maximum of six Iroquois in the squadron. Have to remember 723 still had to carry out their other training and, and uh, operational duties. We learnt new formations, uh, Bs of five staggered left and right which would become commonplace to us once we deployed. Live firing of weapons, training from the aircraft, we ended up with, with fixed mount M60s uh, and we used Beecroft brains. Small arms training with 9mm and SLR, we would not use any of those weapons other than the M60. We wouldn't use those personal weapons while with the US Army. An Army warrant officer uh, was brought down who had the task of trying to introduce a bunch of Navy air crew and maintenance crew into the Army ways. I still remember the poo lesson. I won't go any further into that. Uh, I think he spent most of his time shaking his head and pulling his hair out about this bunch about to deploy to Vietnam. Combat assault training commenced with, the, with uh, Army units at Tianjara and Holsworthy. Uh, mind you, while this was a worthwhile introduction to the combat assault operation, I found it very different in my second day of in-country training with the 187th Assault Helicopter Company out of Tay Ninh when I was bunny hopping around in a rice paddy uh, pickup zone with a full load of US troops in a very tired and old Delta model, uh, Iroquois that is, trying to get airborne while maintaining the integrity of the 10 ship staggered formation. Interesting. Density altitude over the moon and goodness only knows what the all up weight was. Never did find that out. Uh, back here, though, uh, two to three day course uh, at uh, Army Middle Head Intelligence School and uh, with a Vietnamese uh, language introduction. Um, Didi Mao and Bami Ba are about the extent of the language knowledge uh, that we gained. Two day, uh, one night uh, evasion exercise. Basically, we were let loose in teams of four down Conjol away and had to track to Huskisson with some ground types looking for us. The local police and residents were uh, told about these dangerous air crew who were loose in their suburbs and areas uh, and to uh, dob us in if, we, if they found us. Later debriefing over a beer or two indicated that some acts of larceny, skullduggery may have taken place all in the interest of fulfilling transport requirements, personal hygiene and empty stomachs. A bit of fun but possibly not a big help in preparing us to go to war. Five day exercise with a working up uh, RAR, uh, Royal Australian Regiment, Glenn Davis and Gospers, uh, northwest of RAF Richmond, living in the field, flying combat assaults, extractions, direct combat assault, uh, support, uh, air crew sleeping in tents in the bush, far cry from HMAS Melbourne, the uh, four Charlie bathrooms or four deck wardrobe. Valuable exercise to give us, as a unit, some insight into what to expect when we arrived in country with the added advantage that we weren't being shot at. That experience came later. May note here that I made, have made no mention of jungle survival. Uh, Mac talked a lot about jungle survival and stuff. Uh, well, I haven't mentioned it yet, but most of the first flight air crew would have been previously qualified. But for example, I hadn't completed a Canungra course uh, of any sort, jungle survival, prior or well, after I'd finished pilot training in 66. I didn't receive that tick in the box actually until I returned from Vietnam and completed an S2 tracker off, yes, just slipped through the track. When I suggested to the 851 senior pilot, Jim Campbell, who most of you, or some of you will know, uh, that I should be granted a pass for jungle survival course, having survived a year in Vietnam, uh, I was told to get a move on and get on board the bus <laughs> and go to Kanunga. Uh, the first flight did not complete Army battle efficiency training of any sort. Uh, we didn't have time. But two, two, three and four did, as Mac has uh, told you about. Tough three weeks of training. Uh, and, and I won't go any further into that, but other than to say that one OIC attributed this training to, to creating a high level of team spirit and cohesion right across his unit. Not just talking here about air crew, talking about the whole unit. Some person... Uh, uh, it is not known if all members of his flight shared his enthusiasm, though. He was fairly enthusiastic. 
Some personnel uh, also from later flights completed the very demanding code of conduct course. Again, first flight, we didn't do any of that. First flight, we had six weeks for workup. Subsequent flights in the region of eight to nine months in conjunction with uh, other uh, seven to three flying duties, I would assume. According to my logbook, between the 28th of August of uh, 1967 and the 8th of October 67, I flew 62 hours, giving me a grand total flight time of 752 hours. Other than the UHB uh, 1B REFAM and IRT, I uh, already mentioned some of the other things we did, but formation, gunnery, air mobile assaults, extraction, resupply, naval guns fire support, and artillery, uh, artillery air spotting, confined area flying, and heavy weight operations, so the order of the day and the night. This culminated in a combat assault, albeit with blue and white UH-1Bs and CMF troops from Wollongong at the 1967 uh, Nara Air Day into the rather benign Western Pad. We were now ready to, to deploy. Before I close out this segment, some insights regarding pre-deployment training, both positive and negatives, from some other crew persons who will remain nameless. First quote, our training was completed by early October and it seemed as if we did, if all we did was a little bit of everything and really learnt nothing, unquote. A second quote, to this day, I believe that our training left a lot to be desired and was never thought through. Very little, little interest was shown in this unit by those at Nara. In fact, we were a constant nuisance to the fixed wing jockeys who were doing proper flying, and we simply got in the way to theirs and the air traffic controllers' annoyance. Nothing's changed, probably. A third, a third quote, uh, to balance that out, by this stage, and this was for the workup of Flight 4, the RAN had developed a training regime for the flight that was as far removed from the initial contingent as could be imagined. The philosophy seemed to be that if we were to be deployed as soldiers, we would be the best soldiers possible in the circumstances. And I, that author, believe that on this occasion, the Navy got things 100% correct, unquote. The point to make here, of course, is that flights uh, three and four had the real advantage of being able to draw on the vast experience of flights one and two personnel as they rotated back to Australia and ensure that pre-deployment training became more credible. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Our next speaker is Commander Max Speedy, who was 2IC of the 2nd HFE and will recount his experience of flying in Vietnam with the US Army. I'm here to talk to you about uh, the flying side of life in the 135th with the American Army, bearing in mind that I'm Next, flip it over. Thanks. Here we go. There's a bit of a dog and pony show here. <laughs> oh, yeah, right here. Yeah. I got to Vietnam uh, more or less as a pier head jump, but I was the 2IC and uh, not quite happy to be so, but there I was, and with my seniority, um, I still had very, very low pilot hours. Now, bearing in mind that I'm talking about US Army aviation, South Vietnam was split up into four core tactical zones, and the 135th was a very small part of the southern half of Vietnam, which was run by the 1st Aviation Brigade as a very large organisation, and we were uh, tucked in under that uh, various uh, battalions from time to time, but always the 135th. This organisation, and everyone loves an org chart in a PowerPoint presentation, this is my only one. Um, this organisation was stood up in 1963, uh, sorry, 65, I beg your pardon. At that time, there were 250 Huey aircraft in Vietnam. This organisation is 68. It had changed a little over the three years. And in that three years, it had grown to 3,500 aircraft. And in the 1st Aviation Brigade, of which you can only see a very small part uh, for, of the 12th group, but the others on that line uh, have similar organisations to the one... No, no, no. 
that we're showing, um, that organisation grew to 4,500 officers and 19,500 warrant officers. At the time, America was conscripting 130,000 of its men per month to go into the whole of the US armed forces. Not everyone went to Vietnam, a large number did. At the time, I think the flight schools in America were pushing, pushed through 40,000 warrant officer pilots. So how did a group of simple sailors get to be mixed up in all of this? Army was being, our army was being supported by Nine Squadron and our Fleet Air Arm Masters thought it would be a nice idea if uh, we could raise a squadron of Hueys to go to Vietnam and do the same thing. Except when they started to think about it, the aircraft, if there were going to be any left, would have been surplus to requirements at the end of the war. And so instead of a squadron of personnel with equipment, it was just a small squadron of personnel. And so were born the four contingents of which you probably know more than I do. Every assault helicopter company in Vietnam looked like this. On the left-hand side of the screen, they had about 31 aircraft all up. The numbers changed a little from time to time. 31 in uh, my case, of which we were required and did put up 15 or 16 a day, depending on where we had to go to. We always had the command and control aircraft, 10 slicks, 4 gunships, and if, as often frequently occurred, uh, flying very long distances to our area of operations for the day, we'd take a spare along uh, in case one was shot down because 10 aircraft equaled to 100 troops equaled a company and that's how we operated, a company of soldiers to get them on the ground and move them around. On the, on the right hand side is the organisation of each uh, assault helicopter company except with this one we have Australians in it, a CO uh, was an army major, the lieutenant commander OICs of our contingents were the executive officers and had all the authority that went with that and the rest of us uh, rank for rank and qualification for qualification fitted into the organisation and I believe we did so remarkably well. About 180 aviators in the company of which uh, about a third flew every day. Now, in my time there, and I think in everybody else's time, we only had three or four stand-down days. Christmas Day, New Year's possibly, Thanksgiving, I can't quite remember, I think was another day, um, and there might well have been uh, one for Buddha's birthday, Tet, but uh, Tet got messed up a couple of times. Each uh, contingent went to Vietnam with a directive from the Chief of Navy and it said a whole heap of things over its page and a half of instructions about what to do and not to do with the, uh, on the administrative side of life. But the important thing on this particular slide are the words, should you be imperiled, um, tell somebody and get the hell out of it, basically. Well, the fact of the matter is it was an impossible direction simply because if I was, and when I was a co-pilot, I'd be under an American pilot's command in that aircraft. When I became a captain, I would have three other Americans in my aircraft. When I was the slick leader, I had ten aircraft behind me. When I was command and control pilot, I had the gunships and all the rest of it. But in the back of my aircraft, in the command and control aircraft, was the battalion commander whose troops we were carrying and he was telling us where our sol his soldiers had to go. Now, we didn't necessarily always like his ideas and there was plenty of discussion about what the best way to kill this cat would be, but be that as it may, whilst there was frequent discussion, we ignored the direction. It was as simple as that. We could never have adhered to it anyway. We did better than that. We never received the direction. <laughs> no, well, in my... I, I tell you, I have only come mm. to know of this dire uh, direction in the last five or ten years of my life. And the next bit, uh, which is going to talk about rules of engagement, um, today, and this is especially for the youngsters who are in this uh, audience, if you haven't read the rules of engagement on the web, 
you'd better do so. It's a book about yay thick and it's not a bad read actually. But in our day, we were told that we were going to be given rules of engagement and they never happened. And the fact of the matter was, in fact, that depending on where we were operating, um, we would use suppressive fire without taking fire first. Um, we generally always prepared the sides, prepared, lovely word, prepared the size of, sides of the landing zones, the nipper palms, the jungle clearings, those sorts of things. Um, if only because the troops getting out of our aircraft needed that first five or ten seconds to get themselves organised. And generally speaking, we didn't take fire, not always, we took plenty of fire in all sorts of places, but generally speaking, we didn't take fire until we actually had the aircraft on the ground and the troops starting to get out. That's when everyone was most vulnerable, and if the enemy could get some troops, better if they could knock an aircraft down, then we were committed and they had a decent fight on their hands and could cause all sorts of trouble. Uh, this is our flight line at Black Horse. Very primitive uh, affair. Lots of 44 gallon drums filled with uh, sand uh, for revetments and that sort of thing. And when we moved to Bear Cat sometime later, we moved into what really was a very large uh, city. Um, it was a Thai army base, damn near as dangerous in this place as it was out in the field because this is where the Thais learnt to uh, bring in their drugs, exchange them for uh, television sets and the rest of it and send them home to their families. It became a very dangerous place. Be that as it may, uh, one day, uh, uh, sorry, over three days in uh, January 1969, um, we got 99 rockets just in one hit. A standard day for us was 4.30 down at the aircraft, not wakey-wakey, down at the aircraft ready to go. We would pre-flight, um, start them up. If they started, that was good. We'd go off and have our breakfast, come back after a briefing and fly away uh, at around about 6 o'clock. The important thing is that in that time between trying to start and having breakfast and so on, if the aircraft had an unserviceability, we would, uh, the sorry, the maintainers would come in and, uh, and fix it up for us. The, the crew of all of our aircraft, the command and control, the slicks and the gunships was always a crew of four. Two pilots in case one of them was shot. A crew chief, whose aircraft it basically was, and the crew chief would conduct the, uh, the first line maintenance, oils and greases and those sorts of things. Generally we helped out with the cleaning at the end of the day. And the fourth person was the gunner who had the M60s uh, to look after and his job was the, uh, that side of the affair. For personal weapons, the pilots had a uh, police, uh, a Smith & Wesson 38. Police special, totally bloody useless at anything beyond three or four feet. Um, the, air cr the crew chief and the gunner had an M16 each as their personal weapon. When we got shot down, uh, we would take their M16s and the, they would look after the M60s. And that's how we would look after ourselves when we went down on the ground. There was a little bit of... Um, armour plating around our seats, mostly the back and the sides, but that really only covered about half of our bodies or a little less. And then across the front was a uh, very heavy chicken plate that we called it a uh, ceramic arrangement, um, which would stop um, 7.62 rounds and a flak jacket over the top of that. But the rest of us was, that's the second time I've done that, I'll get thrown out soon. Uh, the, the rest of the time, the rest of our bodies was relatively uh, unprotected. Crew chief and gunner were very unprotected in their jobs, very unprotected. And uh, I think it's a tribute to their bravery that they managed as well as they did. Moving on to the gunship types, this pilot, by the way, was the guy who took me on my first flights, Bob Anders. And uh, he, by the way, was leading the second gunship behind uh, Mike Phillips and 
Noel ship when they shot down, were shot down on the uh, 31st of May, 69. So Bob was there. The standard, there were three types of gunship. This is the C model gunship, 19 rockets aside, there. And occasionally they had a frog grenade launcher in the front called Thumper because it really did thump the hell out of the aeroplane. Uh, basically a hand, a hand grenade on the end of a shotgun shell. Very, small, very slow time of flight, very difficult to aim, but not a bad weapon. Now this is where we uh, click over to have a look at the next type of aircraft we get. Um, this is one of the standard 19 side rocket jobs. Um, two major types of landing zone that we went into um, and, we, and uh, for most of the time the second, third and fourth contingents operated uh, to the west and south of uh, Saigon. The whole of the Mekong Delta was dead flat, uh, probably for the whole of its 200 miles east-west and 300 miles north-south there would be no spot, except for a couple of small exceptions, which was higher than about two or three feet above sea level, which helped when you were night flying. The second type of landing zone was in the rice paddies, um, with huts nearby. And it's at this point in the, in the whole process where Merry Hill can break loose. The troops are just on the ground just starting to get out and someone could pop out of that hut in the background there and play merry hell with the whole of the flight. Now this is the uh, precursor to another bit of movie. Um, give it a go, see what happens. Please, it's, uh, I'm sorry about this. Next slide. Yes please, next slide, which is the movie, a movie. Oh, it's trying. Um, one of my pilots was Tony Hewlin, who was killed in uh, January 1969 and was replaced by Jed Hart uh, two or three weeks later. And Jed flew with me for the very first time, uh, his very first flight in Vietnam, as I, and I was slick leader. I'll run through this. So the, this is a bit sad, I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue to apologise. Later, with hundreds of combat assaults, says Jed, I couldn't recall one PZ or LZ from another, but that day I remember Zork Rorschheim, our air mission commander, guiding the lead ship of the flight to land short of the three burning helicopters. I thought about our narrow workup, where we trundled happily into land in neat formation and hovered gently down onto the grass. When you're training, of course, the machine gun rounds only go in one direction. There's no shooting back. This wasn't like that at all. There were rockets and minigun being pumped into the tree lines bordering our LZ by our own light fire team. And our machine gunners and crew chiefs were hammering away with M60s as hard as they could go from every slick, but we were still under heavy fire. When you're in a flight of 10 helicopters, of course, you're not weaving and ducking. You're following your leader, slowing down and coming to a halt right where the shooting is. It wasn't a comfortable feeling, our helicopter stayed in the hover for seconds while troops were hurled onto the paddies. It was done quickly, but we were all no faster than the slowest ship. And once we'd completed the first insertion, we flew off for another load so we could do it all over again. <laughs> Bloody hell, said Jet. And I apparently thought it was rather funny and said, welcome to Vietnam. Now, there's another two uh, little clips that go on to that. If you look at it in the podcast, it hopefully it'll come up a bit better. Um, but anyway, I tried. Next one, please. Kill that. Uh, when we were shot down, as um, Jeff and uh, uh, John McCartney pointed out to you, there would be a team would come out into the field and try and fix us up. And uh, a tribute to all the maintainers, who were exceptionally good, who always came out and tried to get us going in the field. Uh, and most of the time they did. But if they couldn't, a Chinook would come and take us away 
uh, and they could pick us up and have the aircraft back in base probably in about, what have I got on the slide, an hour, but that would be pretty par for the course from the pickup back to base, which could be quite some distance. Uh, many of you may well know the story of uh, Tom Supple and Rick Simmons getting shot down. And by the way, we also smoked in the aircraft uh, whenever and however. And with doors off, uh, there was a rule that everyone, one person in the crew had to have a fag going so that you could light up from the others because it was too windy to have matches and cigarette lighters. Tom Supple and Rick Simmons were shot down one day and uh, this is what Tom has to say about the event. Late one afternoon, our gunship was hit by 50 cal. Traces the size of golf balls crashed through the perspex and we were on our way down. Clearing the crash site, we took cover behind a rice dike, defending ourselves as best we could with the weapons at hand. We are on our own and we'd soon be overrun by the advancing troops. I don't know what, if any, discussion took place between Mike Perrett and Bob Kyle, Mike in the audience, but they were well aware that by coming to our aid it was odds on that they wouldn't survive the attempt. In spite of extremely heavy and constant enemy fire, they did manage to effect a dramatic rescue of all four of us. There were some relatively minor gunshot wounds and their very well ventilated aircraft didn't fly again for a long time. Thanks, fellas, forever indebted. Is Rick here? Is Rick here? I thought I saw him earlier. I saw him yesterday. Yeah, he's, I know he's here. I thought he was in the audience. Anyway, Rick, uh, Rick Simmons and uh, Mike Perrett owe their lives to Mike and Bob Kyle. The thing about that particular thing was that uh, if you survived uh, being shot down in North Vietnam, which was mostly US personnel, and then made it to the ground alive, and then made it alive to the Hanoi Hilton where you would stay as a PO, all well and good, POW, all well and good. In the South, too much trouble, and so these guys, all four, eight of them, would have been executed on the spot. Over 7,000 Hueys went to Vietnam. 3,300 of them were destroyed by enemy action in Vietnam. 2,200 air crew were killed in Vietnam. This is American air crew are killed in Vietnam. Of 58,000 Americans. If it was a good week, there'd only be 100 American soldiers killed. If it was a bad week, it would be up to 600 or more. We lost, Australia lost 521 for the whole war. So you can imagine, or you can understand why the American public got quite uh, sick and tired of the whole business. These are our five people who were killed. I do have here a uh, fairly long diary of uh, the events that uh, surrounded a lot of this, I won't go into it, you can read it and get to it later on. Some statistics for you, just for the second contingent. Quarter of a million troops, 35,000 hours, and that was just par for the course. Our Navy, our Canberra Navy, expected us to be co-pilots under American guidance. In the event, we, I believe, uh, without making too big a thing of it, we became the backbone of the 135th. Uh, as aircraft captains, as flight leaders, platoon leaders, uh, command and control pilots, as maintenance team leaders, uh, doing all sorts of amazing stuff. Not only that, but our cooks made uh, very mundane chow halls into quite respectable, nearly restaurants, as best one could. But um, two of our cooks achieved something like six or seven months of uh, the best battalion chow halls going. A tribute to them, the leading sick berth attendants with our groups uh, during both of the Tet uh, events were all but performing major trauma surgery on their own. Well, sorry, under supervision, but while the doctors were doing one thing, these guys were doing some amazing stuff. 
that they wouldn't, you, you just could not imagine that an LSBA, a leading medic, could be allowed to do that sort of thing today. He'd be a surgeon with 10 or 20 years under his belt or her belt. If it can be put down to just one factor, I think the significant difference between us Australians and the uh, Americans, and the Americans love to call us lifers, uh, was that for the most part, those who'd been conscripted, conscripted, the warrant officers and the, and the younger specialist soldiers, were only there for a short period. Trained to do a job, and by golly they did it well, but for most of them, once their two years is up, they were out. Sure, a lot of them went on to really spectacularly good army careers. Tom Stack, Fred Dunaway, and, and others that we could name, warrant officers especially, who became amazingly good. We integrated well into the American system, and to this day, we continue to have close personal friendships with many of our compatriots. It couldn't be otherwise when you faced a very determined foe and a resourceful enemy and flown so many times into enemy fire. We did a bloody job very well. Thank you very much, Max. Our final speaker in this episode is Lieutenant Commander Jeff Vidal, who flew in Vietnam with 9 Squadron RAAF. Good afternoon, all. Eight of the pilots who went to Vietnam from the Royal Australian Navy went to 9 Squadron. 20%. Very rarely do you hear about the Navy involvement in Nine Squadron. It was very unusual today to hear Chief of Navy actually mention Nine Squadron specifically. It just doesn't happen. There's nowhere near 20% of the talking about RAN in Vietnam attached to Nine Squadron. And the thing is that posting to Nine Squadron for the pilots was just the luck of the draw just the way DNOP does their magic, throws their darts or whatever they do. And indeed, there was one of the air crew who went to the second flight of HFV who was actually posted to Nine Squadron. But because he was delayed in the States, there was a quick change uh, at short notice. And so that's as random as it was for the postings. The Preparation for aircrew going to Nine Squadron was a bit different to what you've heard for the HFV. We were, first of all, working with Five Squadron in Canberra, and that, that did involve a number of weeks up in Shoalwater Bay working with the Australian Army in their work up for deployment. The eight who went to Nine Squadron in Vietnam went up in a staggered sort of group. The first one was Tony Hill, went up in February of 68. Marty Ward and I were the second and third to go up. We went on the 11th of March, flew up in the same aircraft as Vic Batiste, who was going to replace Pat Vickers. The final five of the RAN in Nine Squadron ended up in Vietnam in May of 68, and the return home was similarly staggered. On our arrival, in Vung Tau, we were accommodated in rather flash sort of quarters at the airfield. Uh, the Air Force had only just moved over to the airfield about the same time indeed that the first HFV moved from Villas in Vung Tau to Black Horse, Nine Squadron moved from Villas in Vung Tau to Vung Tau Airfield. The, uh, the role of Nine Squadron was principally to, us, to support the Australian Task Force in Phuc Thuy Province. It was a fairly limited area of operations. Nine Squadron began their operations with eight UH-1Bs, the Bravo models. They were uh, supplemented towards the end of 1967 by the first of eight, uh, or by the first eight UH-1H that the Air Force uh, took over. They were purchased from the States, arrived in boxes in Tonsonute, were put together, uh, and in fact, uh, Ray Godfrey from the first HFE flight was um, down in, in Saigon, and he flew one of those first aircraft, uh, first hotel model aircraft for the 
RWF uh, up to, to Vung Tau for them. The, um, the reality was there was a time lag between what the government was saying, what the army was doing, and further on the train, what the Air Force was doing to support them. It was OK for Harold Holt to say, we are going to put another two battalions of Australians in Nui Dat. We're going to build up the number of Australians to 8,000 in Nui Dat. There was a time lag for the Air Force to get themselves organised and buy the aircraft and get them there. The first commanding officer of uh, Nine Squadron had actually done a, uh, a big trip to Vietnam in 1964 to find out what was happening with helicopters and he had done uh, about six months over in the States, uh, mainly with the US Air Force, uh, in his preparation of, uh, of what was likely to be needed and indeed what turned out to be needed in the uh, Australian Air Force Iroquois support to the troops. The Australian Army initially was simply not able to be moved in large numbers by those small number of aircraft the RWF had. And so until mid-1967, um, so mid-1968, for any regimental lift of Australian Army, the Australian Army called upon the US system for support. And so frequently even the 135th flew the missions moving Australian Army. In the middle of 1968, that all changed when the Air Force had their 16 hotel model Bravos and the Australian Air Force would do their own regimental lifts. Still for a while being covered by light fire teams that came from the States. The, the Taipans from the 135th and other uh, gunship teams from the United States uh, Army actually supported the Australians until the middle of uh, 1969 when the Australian Air Force had uh, their own gunships, which was uh, a unique sort of fit out of a UH-1H with the rockets and uh, the miniguns. I think they carried a bit more ammunition than the Charlie models did. There were 16 bins carrying nearly 10,000 rounds for the miniguns in the Air Force uh, hotel model aircraft. The routine work of Nine Squadron was to resupply food, ammunition, clothes, stores, the things that the army in the field needed. Hash and trash was what the, the US called it, um, and that was a, a principal role. There was some support to local uh, government um, needs in Fuktui province and the local small detachments of Arvan in Fuktui province. Not all the work that Nine Squadron did was routine uh, and not all according to the books. There was uh, one incident I've read of where in early uh, 1966, in the back of one Bravo model Iroquois, the Air Force put 22 women and children to take them from Long Son Island to Berea. There were a number of rescues that took place. The uh, first one I was involved in was a, a mid-air collision between a couple of FAC aircraft over the Long High Hills. And uh, the uh, Air Force again got involved with 135th uh, uh, leading seaman uh, Kevin French and, and uh, Naval Airman uh, Ken Wardell, crewmen of one of the 135th aircraft, were rescued by Nine Squadron on the 12th of January 1968 uh, when John Leake and Andy Craig crashed in May of uh, 1968, they were winched out of the jungle by a Nine Squadron aircraft. Nine Squadron operations included uh, a mixed bag of things, artillery spotting, reconnaissance, carrying VIPs around, frequently doing medevacs. By, uh, by the middle of 1968, the Nine Squadron medevac system was very uh, tightly organised. They had two crews on permanent standby. At night time, one of them was at the squadron on immediate readiness. 
Um, later on, after I left in early 69, that Medivac aircraft was on standby up at Nui Dat. Uh, and by the, the end of 1968, 9th Squadron had actually carried out 2,000 Medivacs. They'd carried 150,000 passengers, not quite up to the quarter of a million you spoke of, Max, in, uh, in your one year there. And they had, 9th Squadron had carried 12 million pounds of freight up until the end of 68. As far as our flying was concerned, there was no difference between RAF and Navy. We crewed together, co-pilots, captains, as necessary. Um, there was a little weariness, I think, from the RWF of the uh, five RAN pilots who'd actually been trained in the States. I think that threw the Air Force a little bit. They had their, their system where they knew the people that had trained with Winston James at Point Cook and Fred Lane at, at Pierce, they were a little bit wary about the American trained ones and so maybe DNOP should have thought that one through a bit harder. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the integration was pretty standard, even down to the fact that we junior officers did junior officers' jobs. I was assistant bar officer for a while. <laughs> of all things, I was a unit history officer night by night writing the unit history and, and for a while in a similar role to a naval divisional officer I was OIC crewmen and gunners. Uh, didn't have much to do with the worry with the crewmen, they were very highly trained crewmen but the gunners were normally airfield defence guards or others that were stuck in the, the aircraft to go flying, they needed a little bit of, bit of training and uh, so I was responsible for that. Bear in mind the flying rate for the RAAF 9 Squadron was directly proportional to the activity of the Australian Army. If the Australian Army was busy, 9 Squadron was busy. If the Australian Army was not busy, 9 Squadron was not busy. And so in our year in Vietnam, we in the Air Force system flew only about 700 hours quite a considerable uh, reduction in the hours compared to the 1,200 hours or so flown by the 135th. I should point out that, um, as Max said, often the 135th would fly for an hour and a half before they got to their operation area and then fly an hour and a half home. So sort of three hours for every day's flying in, in transit flying where the Air Force were right at their area operation all the time. Take off from Vung Tau, first job was to supply, uh, to drop something off at one of the Army um, fire support bases, whatever. We're always based in Nui Dat, immediately in our operational area. There was virtually no transit flying. When, in the middle of 1968, the Australian Army had the big operations that included the battles of Balmoral and Coral, the Australian Air Force took three aircraft up to uh, a base called Phu Loi, about 10 miles, uh, 15 or so kilometres north of Saigon, and RWF aircraft were based there for the duration of those uh, operations. And I was one of the ones who was up there at that time, and I know we found it quite different. The... Um, the normal decorum in the officers' mess at Nine Squadron was quite different to the way the, uh, the unit flying at Fu Loi money were the Tomahawks, and they behaved quite differently in the mess at night. <laughs> Daily routines were based around a, a, a rostering officer appointing the crews for the following day. The Air Force uh, basically had an Albatross 1 to Albatross 8. Albatross 1 being the C&C aircraft, the lead aircraft, um, and did a fair bit of the work. 2 did the next amount of work down to if there were only the need for five aircraft on one particular day, there was no Albatross 06. Sometimes when uh, they had a big regimental lift and you, you needed uh, you know, a 10 aircraft formation to carry the the Army, we could have a albatrosses 10 and 11. 
call sign albatross stems from the relationship or the history of Nine Squadron, Nine Squadron being the parent squadron for the Walrus aircraft, those that flew on board Sydney and Canberra and Perth. And so the Nine Squadron Roll of Honour includes uh, many of those people that were, uh, were on those, those ships in the Second World War. Each of the Navy pilots with uh, Nine Squadron RAF went on exchange the 135th, or with the exception of the commander, uh, Rolly Waddell Wood didn't go. We would spend one week with the 135th, and during that time we, uh, we were very social with our fellow RAN uh, members, but there was also a chance to look at different ways of flying, um, and it was a good, a good exchange. It came unstuck, according to different versions I've heard. One senior Air Force pilot got very... Uh, concerned about the less than formal administration of flying arrangements with the 135th. Uh, I've heard that one flying officer was incredibly upset about having to live in a tent and the standard of accommodation didn't seem right. But whatever the true story was, that exchange unfortunately stopped. Uh, but after all the, all the RAN pilots at Nine Squadron had had at least some time at uh, the 135th. Marty Ward had an extended time with the 135th. He became the replacement pilot for John Leake when John Leake uh, uh, crashed and, and had his crook back. Um, Marty flew for three months with the, the 135th uh, until the, the first HFE returned to Australia when Marty returned to Nine Squadron at Bung Tower. And, and I think... Andy Craig spent an extended time with the 135th when he came back from uh, that accident. But whatever the thing was, there were certainly some questions about uh, uh, the Nine Squadron performance being um, seen to be not as flashy as it should be. And I wouldn't like to be too enthusiastic and too sort of biased in defending Nine Squadron. That's not my role. But could I point out that there is a real problem in comparing a US Army operation and an Australian Air Force operation. There'd even be problems comparing a US Army and a US Air Force operation. Little alone Navy Air Force stuff. But, but it's more than just normal grassroots inter-service rivalry. There is some criticism warranted. The RAF rank, rank structure was relatively top-heavy. When I began in Nine Squadron, we had a squadron leader as CO and, and two other squadron leaders in the squadron. Within about six months, when they got their extra aircraft, the squadron leader, the, the, uh, the squadron CO was a wing commander, and there were four two and a halfs, including Ro Rolly Waddell Wood. It's a bit top heavy. And certainly, the Australian philosophy of protecting limited assets was not something the US were accustomed to. You've seen on the slide how many, how many aircraft the US had. Well, that's not the case for the Australian forces. So there was this background of being a little bit more cautious with assets than the people at 135th uh, were finding. And, and indeed, this is not just military. Last week, I heard a war correspondent uh, war correspondent being interviewed by Richard Feidler and he was talking about how things changed tremendously when he stopped working for Channel 9 and went to work for CNN. And he was saying exactly the same things about the CNN attitude to resources and doing things that's exactly parallel to what I perceive as the attitude uh, up in the 135th. There are some myths... There are some stories that get bandied around um, and, and I'd just like to set one thing straight. You know, you, you've probably all heard about some criticism of the RLF getting to Long Tan, the Battle of Long Tan, and how it was hard for those two aircraft to go and provide the desperately needed ammunition. I don't think many people know 
But at that stage, Nine Squadron had eight Bravo model Iroquois. Seven of them were sitting on the ground at Nui Dat about an hour after the battle started, as soon as they knew there were a large number of casualties. Seven aircraft and crews were sitting at Nui Dat waiting, waiting, waiting to be called in to do their evacuation. They got called in at midnight, told no lights. They went into this small clearing in the middle of the rubber at Long Tan, one at a time, led by a torch to pull out wounded Australians after Long Tan. Now, I don't think many people know that. Um, perhaps it's a bit cynical of me to say that there's some embellished stories of what Nine Squadron didn't do in Vietnam that uh, were built up to help the case along for the army to become the owners of the Black Hawks and Chinooks. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think perhaps uh, I'll conclude by saying that the, the most lasting legacy of Nine Squadron RAF in Vietnam, and that for the Navy pilots were there, is that they had an incredibly close relationship with the Australian Army, particularly the SAS, dropping SAS patrols into the jungle and pulling them out, often hot extractions. The Air Force didn't shirk from firefights. Though those contacts have resulted in a, a lasting uh, relationship Next year, we are invited to a, a big celebration of the second SAS regiment to be held up in Brisbane. And I think that legacy of uh, cooperation between the Australian Army and the Australian Air Force is one of the, the spin-offs that I treasure most about my time with uh, the Ninth Squadron. Thanks, Jeff, for rounding out a really fascinating first session. It also brings to a close this first episode of our podcast on the RAN fleet air arm in the Vietnam War. We hope that you will join us next week for the second episode, which will include a US Army perspective, some thoughts on leadership of the HFV, and challenges facing the maintenance crews. <laughs>